So we're going to look at how we leave is how we enter. How we leave is how we enter. And you know, I'm, I said this before, but we cannot be shocked at this. I, I, Jenny keeps records of, of what I speak on, and it was last November that God said, take care of my spiritual house, I'll sort out the spiritual build, the, the building for you. So, you know, through the year, you know, we prayed intermittently, not really put much of a focus on a building, even though the frustration of being here at times has just got a little bit intense because of setting up, packing, you know, all that type of thing. But you know, when God comes and provides a building, we shouldn't really be shocked. Because if you're ex if you're in expectation, you are waiting for the prayer to be answered. So when he does answer prayer, then we should really say, "Wow, well, I didn't really expect that," because faith is expectation. So, you know, God's been good to us um, in terms of giving the building. I was on Zoom on Thursday night. And I said to a group of guys from all over the world, actually. Um, I said to them, we've done, Jane, I've done nothing to get the building because it's come from God's goodness, but it's come because of Jenny and me. Now you're going to think, pardon? Why do I say that? Because, you know, God will entrust certain things to people when you've passed your test. And some people, you don't get what you want because you've never passed your test. Well, we don't. God doesn't, God does work like that. Joseph, God gave Joseph a dream, but Joseph wasn't promoted to the to be the head of Egypt or the second in command of Egypt until he passed all the tests. He can whinge and complain all he likes, but he's never going to get promoted until he passes the test. And most of the tests that he had to face were because people did things to him. But the reason why people God allowed things to be done to him was because of his attitude. And he was a bit cocky with Joseph because he wanted to tell everybody how good he was. And he thought he was something special. And God says, well, I'm going to take you down a peg or two, Joseph, because where I'm taking you, if you have that attitude in that position, you are not going to save Israel. You're going to destroy Israel. So I've got to work in you before I promote you. So, like I said, we haven't got the building because we're anything special, because we're not. It's down to the goodness of God. And I'm not saying this to both, but I, you know, a guy, I think this guy called the Nobby was his name, a guy in London, he's, um, he's an Indian man of the very, very, very high caste system in India. So he's an incredibly wealthy, well-to-do um, Indian man. And he came on, I didn't know him, and he, he phoned me yesterday, actually, when I got home from this publishing college again. And he, and he came on, he says, Keith, he says, God's just given me a word for you. Oh. He says, just for everybody else who's on this platform, you don't know me, do you? I said, I've got a clue you are. No, I've never met you. I don't know you, don't know anything. I said, you don't know, I've never spoke to you. I've never seen you before. And <clears throat> he went on to prophesy about having passed the test that God had given us. And now God was putting us in a place where we were going to, dig the wells open again. And this was his interesting phrase. Think of what we've said in this place. A revival is going to come in that building. That's what he said to me. Well, as soon as I heard revival, my ears pricked up. I thought, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. And you don't know me. You don't know us at all. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying that to boast. That just came, that came to us. But, uh, you know, there were things we have to go through as people. And, you know, we can whinge and moan and bypass it and, uh, and blame all the people and it's his fault, it's his fault. But unless we pass the test, and that test, when you sit at our level exam, I'm showing my age, because it's GCSEs and everything. When you took your old level exam, your A level exam, no one sat it for you, did they? Well, not in my day, because that was called a cheat. <laughs> I mean, you did it yourself. So you couldn't say, well, you know, can you sit the exam for me? You have to take that exam myself. How we leave this place is important because it's how we enter the new place as a group, but individually. 
You know, we can complain now, and if we do, we'll complain when we move. We can walk in disunity now, but we'll walk in disunity when we move. We can have a stinky attitude now, but we'll have a stinky attitude when we move. You can ignore me now, but you'll ignore me when we move. Or we can be in unity now, and we'll be in unity when we move. So what do you want? What would you like? I know what I'd like. I know what I'd like. This becomes this becomes important. This isn't to tell you off message. This is only a short introduction. But it's important because we've got to take responsibility for our own lives when we move. You know, when you move house physically, you move house from whatever address you are to another address. You don't sit there putting your feet up in your rocking chair, you know, expecting everyone to do the work, take everything to the new house, unpack all the boxes while you just sit there having a cigar on the porch. Do you? Unless you're an incredibly lazy person. You don't do that. You know, you take responsibility for the move and you take responsibility for your own actions in that move. And we can't be blaming other people. If you don't get involved with the removal men, if they do it for you and they damage you, your priceless vase, you can't complain if you just left them to it. And you, you know, you just, I wasn't involved. Well, you gotta get involved, don't you? You've got to get involved. Well, I don't like this, and I don't like that, and I don't, I, you know, I know what churches are like. I've been around church in my entire life. My, I spent my childhood at this church. I was at a Methodist church before that, where I used to play football in the hall and smack the football against all the lights and break the lights. That was my start in church life, breaking all the lights in the church building. But we, we went to this church. And I know what it's like because everyone will point the finger at the pastor and blame him for how they feel, how they behave, how their attitude. And yet, in my world, what I see, our attitude, our behavior is our responsibility. Don't lay it at my feet and blame me. Now, you say, well, you don't understand. I do really understand. And because I'm saying it because I understand. Actually, I'm saying it because I really do understand. Because how we leave this place is how we're gonna enter the next. And I don't want, there's a verse that Lynn, Lynn made a throwaway comment to the prayer meeting, either this Wednesday or the Wednesday before. And she just said that God had shown her from Exodus, there'll be no hoof left behind. Okay? There'll be no hoof left behind. No, there's a song, there's an old song to this. I'm not gonna sing it, it's, it's shocking. It really is a bad song. But there's, God said to Moses, there's going to be no hoof left behind. What do you mean by that? There's going to be no animal. There's going to be nothing left behind in Egypt. And the important thing is when we leave this place, God doesn't want anything or anyone left behind. He doesn't want anyone or anything left behind. He wants everybody to go and he wants everything. Now, when he says everything, that includes your attitude. That includes the way you think. That includes the way you speak. Now what's important is, if those things are not good, then what do we need to do? Get rid of them before we move. Because then when we move, they won't be left behind in a negative sense. God will have dealt with them. So how we leave this place is how we enter the new place. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Now, I just want to read from Exodus chapter 13. Have I actually got anywhere, Vanessa, on that PowerPoint? No, sorry. I'm glad you're reading it and not me. Exodus 13, verse 17 to 21. That's probably the hardest job in the room, that is, there, Vanessa. Sorry. I'll do my best. Exodus 13, verse 17 to 21. Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. God took them on a journey. Lest perhaps the people would change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Well, they did, because some of them complained and wanted to go back to Egypt. It's amazing how we, even if things are difficult, sometimes we prefer that comfort of difficult than the freedom that we can get if we actually change. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under Solomon, saying, God will surely visit you 
and you will carry up the bones from here with you. Now, let me just throw this in for free. When I read that, I thought, what's the importance of taking Joseph? I don't want to take no dead bone with me. And God said, listen, he says there, Joseph wanted them to take his bones with them because he wanted to go to the, the new place and he didn't want to be left behind and he didn't want to be forgotten. Now, when we move to the new building, there's, there's just a handful of older people, as you know, for those who've been. And I don't want to leave those guys behind. Some of those guys have been in that church for 80, 80, zero, 80 years. And we move there with the utmost respect, remembering what they've done, their faithfulness, their commitment. I laugh because I said, they've been there, eight, one lady been there 80 years. You can't get some Pentecostal to go to church 80 times. You know what I mean? They've been there for 80, 80 years. You know what I mean? 80 years. But we've got to go there and remember their sacrifice and remember what they've done before us so that in God's plan and purpose we can move into a place and work with them. In other words, I said there aren't many left and they won't last forever and that's not being rude. But God's given us an opportunity where he says, listen, I want this place. In fact, the oldest man there, Brian, said when he's talking to me, he said, listen, he said, I know God hasn't finished with this place. And I'm, and I'm happy to give it to you, Keith, because I believe that God will continue what he started here through you and through you. And that church is 125 years old. It was once full of three, 400 people that I know of because I was there. That's what it was like. And God said, here, that we remember these people, remember their sacrifice, and we take them with us. It's important that we take them with us. They are, I've spoken to them all. They are more excited than the look on anybody's face in this room. <laughs> Trust me, they are very, very excited that we're going there. Because they said to me, we were scared that this would either be sold as a mosque. Because if you're not sitting, it's a great building. Or it will be turned into apartments. And we didn't want either of that to happen. <coughs> so these guys are excited. But let me, let me just carry on. So they took their journey from Sukkoth and camped in Ethan at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them, here we go, the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and by night. So he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. We've got to understand that God is with us. God is going with us. In fact, God has already gone before us because that phone call that came to me on that afternoon when I was doing my gardening, in my shorts, not a good sight, I know, but I was in the garden, my phone ring, I think, who's that, who on earth wants to phone me? Should I answer it or not? Stop the lawnmower, answer the phone, and it was, would you come take over the church? I said, you know, I'll give any of them phone calls. Do you want to pray? No. No, I'm, I know some people would be spiritual and say, oh yes, I'm going to fast and pray because that's what we think we need to do. I didn't need to, fa I didn't need to fast. I didn't need to pray. If someone's giving you a building, what are you going to do? Oh no. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? Are you stupid? <laughs> it's like, would you come? Yeah. <laughs> are you sure? Yeah. Don't you want to think about it? No. 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 <laughs> that was it. That was it. Job done. It's said, okay, then can you come and see us? Yeah. What do you want? Now that's the type of person I am. You know, very, very decisive. I'm not going to hang around. Would you hang around if someone wants to give you a building? No. <laughs> so I went, but God had gone before me. Yeah. God had gone before me. And I think, and with all fairness, I'm talking now, but when I left that place and when I've had several meetings with them, every time I've left, I've been speechless. So you might actually think, oh, that's a miracle. <laughs> but I've been, I'm just, I didn't know what to say. I got home and I'm like, what's just happened, man? It's just five million pound building. What would you say? Oh, I didn't, I didn't know what to say. You know what I mean? I couldn't even say thank you, God. I, I mean, I didn't. I, I, I couldn't even say that. I was just like, what well, did that happen? I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. 
See, when God goes before us, sometimes we think we've got to push and pull and fight and strive and all these things to do to try and get what we want. And God says, no, man, I'm going before you. I'll, open, I'll make it easy for you. I'll make the path straight. I'll just make it so you're just walking what I've said and I'll sort it out for you. Yeah. He says here, God will go before you. Yeah. When God is for you, who can be against you? I want to read, and this is my message for what time is left. I'm going to go to Psalm 133. I looked at this psalm, I've mentioned it on and off over the last year and a half, but I actually spoke about, the, spoke about this psalm at the beginning of November 2021. Not that I keep a record of when I speak, but I can do that. Yeah, it's written down. And I want to just look at Psalm 133. And let me read the very long song. Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren, for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. And the blessing here is life forevermore. Commanded life forevermore. How we leave this stage of the church's history and journey is important because it will affect the entrance into the new stage. Yeah, but you've only been going just a year and three quarters. That's fine. It's a new stage. It's a new stage in the journey and we're grateful for here. You know, there's a lot of things that haven't been great, you know, coming in at half past eight in the morning and starting to set up. You know, every Sunday ain't the best thing on the planet on a Sunday morning, but it's what we've done. We've been faithful. You know, Danielle has been here every Sunday setting up when some of the rest of us have been in bed. You know, Janet has left home in the early hours. Paul and Natasha have left home in the early hours of the morning to come, to travel, to be here. Being faithful. Being faithful. How good, verse 1 and 2, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. I want to go to Genesis 13. And I just want to talk about Abraham and Lot. Some of you may know Abraham and Lot. They had a bit of a fallout, they had a bit of a ding dong. But Abraham and Lot, verse chapter 13, verse 8. So Abraham said to Lot, please. Let there be no strife between you and me, and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren, okay? For we are brethren. How good and pleasant it is for, for the brethren to dwell in unity, okay? Same word. So Abraham, he says, look, look, I don't need any grief. I don't want any trouble. Let's not be like this. And that word strife means to fight, struggle, or conflict. Now, sometimes, Fighting, struggle, and conflict it may not be seen out outwardly, but inwardly you're fighting and you're in conflict and you're struggling because you don't like what's going on. But God says, I don't want any strife. The word unity, flick through them if you would, but it's, it means to be joined as a whole in full agreement, oneness, in harmony. I like the word harmony, in harmony. God wants us as a people to be in harmony. Now I can't, I can't change anybody. That's down to you and God. I'm not saying that you are in disharmony, but it's a reminder that how we leave this place is how we're going to go into the new place. We are all of different gifting, different talents, different purposes, different characters, personalities, different cultures. We have different upbringings. But there's one thing that brings us all together. We are one in Christ. Yeah. We are one in Christ. Mm. So I'm not bothered the background. I'm not bothered how we look, how we sound, how we behave, whether you like Joloff Rice or not. Sorry, that's for <laughs> Joloff. Yeah, anyway, anyway. It don't matter. But together, we are one. Yeah. Together, we are one. And as Moses took the people out of Egypt. He took them out as one company of people. 
because he said, I don't want anyone left behind. He took them out of one company. And if you pick up what we read a couple of moments ago, he says, they all left in an orderly manner. Try and get a couple of million people to all leave in an orderly car to help. Moses must have been one good leader <laughs> to get a couple of people to all leave in an orderly manner. You, know I mean? you can't even get 10,000 people to leave a football match in an orderly manner. So how did he get two million people to leave in an orderly manner? He carried some anointing in Moses. Our problem is that we have, we see people differently. They have a different view to ourselves. They look different to ourselves. And then we judge them. Don't we? Come on, you do. Don't, you know, don't act as though you don't. We all do. You know, we see things different isn't wrong. Different should be a celebration where people compliment each other. Because we're all different and what people, what you have is different to what I have. So you bring to the table you, I bring to the table me, and together we complement each other. That's the way God has designed the church to be. Not to be segregated and separated like society often wants things and wants people. We're the body of Christ. We've, meant, we've, we've said this, we're meant to protect unity at all costs. Now I've got my disunity radar on, if I'm honest. <laughs> So when I even see it, I'm going to deal with it. Why? Because I ain't going to put up with that because how we leave this place is how we enter. And before God, I've got to have, I have the responsibility to deal with stuff so that we move in unity. See, a difference of opinion doesn't mean we've got to kill each other. But quite often in church means it, we do. Well, I like this. Well, I like that. Well, it's not you that I talk to you again. And that's, I know churches have been like that. I don't want to know loads of them. Those people are immature. They can't handle someone being different. Sometimes we've got to look at our own life. And I, the interesting thing sometimes when you make comments and people we we sit there. I love I love Christian people. That we Christians are bonkers in their times because we just sit here sometimes and a, a point's made and we sit there think ah that's for Sheila, <laughs> that's for Charlie. That is not me. No, 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 no. Jenny, perfect for her. And we sit there smug in our own religiousness. Trying to point the finger at everybody else. When it's not them, look at yourself, man. Don't even get past you. Don't ever consider this is for somebody else. Just think, maybe, maybe, just maybe, it's for me. And if it is, deal with it. If it's not, then you can say it's for Kath. <laughs> Always for Kath. It's not David, it's Kath. But you know what I'm saying? Stop trying to put the blame on everybody else. You focus on you. Deal with you. So because, let me just read Romans 15. Romans 15, verse 7. I, I know, I'm good. I was going to, well, I'm, I'm always going to be sarcastic. I'm always sarcastic. I'm like, but like, you don't know how excited I am to move. You know, I'm English, so I'm like, I'm excited. But I am. I'm, I'm really excited. To move, you know, you know, the prayers that we prayed and my intention of wanting to our own place and our own space to be able to set up and not have to pack away. Yes. <laughs> to then to think we can do mother and toddlers without having to have a five ton truck for each person to take the stuff home every week and bring it back every week. Kath and Derek's house will float away. Sheila's house will float away. Because he's been weighed down with that many toys. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now it's just going to float in the sky. Because there's nothing in it. But we've got space then. We've got space to do it. We've got space to keep the stuff without any problem. We've got space to do, Derek. What do you always say to me about doing? Remind me. Saturday nights. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Come on, man. 
Healing services. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Yeah, he's gone on to be on the last year and a half by doing yeah. Saturday nights. Yeah. Healing services. Yeah. Just I'll pay you left tonight. Yeah, we'll just, <laughs> next time I'll slip you a piece of paper. Yeah. Yeah. Can, oh. Healing services. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Have mercy. He, this ain't going to plan, is it? Anyway. But we can do that. We can do that type of thing yeah. without any effort. <laughs> we can do all this type of stuff. That, ladies. You have your conference there. Woo. We've already got a lady who's, who's, who's keen to come and speak. Shall I throw it out? Yvonne. Lorraine knows her. Yvonne Brooks. Her and her husband run a church in Birmingham, New Jerusalem. Yvonne is a um, phenomenal woman. Absolutely phenomenal lady. So we asked her, say, would you come and do a ladies' conference? I know her husband, Melvin, Bishop Melvin Brooks. Phenomenal people. Absolutely phenomenal in Aston, Birmingham. But we can do what we want now. Because God has gone before us and opened the doors for all these things. You know, the sky is not the limit. Because there is no limit. You know, we say, oh, the sky is the limit. No, it's not, because there ain't no limit. There is no limit on what we can do. And you know what? When we do these things, We've talked about healing. We've talked about uh, revival. We've talked, I tell you, it's going to come that place. One of the ladies said to me, I'm praying that God brings revival in that place. One of the ladies said, before he takes me home. That's what, that's, that's another lady said that to me. See, God's gone before us and he's opened the door. We could have gone to some rundown shack of a dump. But God's took us to a place that he's kept incredibly in good nick. Unity. Yes, let's get back to the message, shall we? It always helps. Let's read Ephesians 4. Sorry, I'll skip Romans 15, Vanessa. Sorry, I'm looking at time. Ephesians 4. And I'm going to read it from the common English version. Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. Ephesians 4. Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all loneliness and gentleness, with long suffering hearing with bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in the hope of one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, he is above all, through all, and in all. That's the King James Version. The common English version, as the prisoner of the Lord, I beg you to live in a way that is worthy of the people of God. Always be humble and gentle, patiently putting up with one another. Love each other. Try your best to let God, try your best to let God's spirit keep your hearts united. Do this by living at peace. All of you are part of the same body. There is one spirit of God, just as you were given one hope when you were chosen to be God's people. Let's read Romans chapter nine. Chapter 12, sorry. Romans chapter 12. From verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Cool, don't even get me started on that verse. That's, a, that's like a, that's an all-day conference, that verse is. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honour, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, giving to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless, do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Oh Lord, we pay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. See, unity is the outcome of the environment we create. Think about it. Unity is the outcome of the environment we create. If we ignore people, I'll speak to him, but I'm not going to speak to him. I'll speak to her, but I'm not going to speak to her. 
then we are not creating unity. We're not. Don't con yourself and think you are, you're not. We, we speak to people, now listen, right, okay, let me just put a caveat here. Just because I don't come and talk to you, right? I'm setting up, I'm packing away, people come and talk to me. If I don't get a chance to run after you and say hello, don't think I hate you, okay? I can't talk to everybody every week, and I can't talk to, and I know there's some people who I talk a lot to, some people who I don't talk a lot to at all. That's not because I'm ignoring you. That's, if you want to talk to me, just come to me, join the queue, and I'm not being funny or anything, but sometimes I'll be classic, yeah, can I speak to you? 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 By the time I've spoken to them, I look up, everyone's gone. I'm like, ah, I didn't get a chance. I can't help that. You know, people come and talk to me. So I don't think I'm going to ignore you, but I'm not talking about that because I know some people intentionally avoid talking to me. They'll talk to you and they'll talk to you and they'll talk to you and they won't talk to me. Now I've said this from day one, you are talking to me, you've got an issue. I'm coming at this unity. Why? I'm coming against the spirit, I'm coming against the spirit that wants to bring disunity to have an effect on this church. Why? Because I'm going to let nothing have an effect on us when we leave this place and enter the new place. Yeah. I've said this from the beginning. You avoid me, you've got an issue. <laughs> oh, you think you are? I'm no one. If you know me by now, I ain't nothing. Born in Hells Owen, in a little house. Grew up in a masonette, moved to Netherton. I ain't nothing. No one special. Nothing at all. The fact that God even saved me and God took me and Jenny to where he's taken us is a miracle in itself. And I was like, God, you know, you are real. Because I wouldn't have gone anywhere in these places if it was down to me. You know what I mean? I'd probably be fried chips in a chip in the or something. You know what? You know, I'll, I'll, nothing wrong with that, by the way. Especially if you like chips. <laughs> but, you know, but I, but I am not going to put up with these things. And, and, you know, there's some things that you turned a blind eye to. And there's some things that comes a point where you say, right, enough's enough. God, we how we leave this place is how we enter. And I'm not going to forsake unity going into a new place because some issues haven't been dealt with. And I'm going to deal with them in the best way that, that I have, that I know how to. See, this place, we've said this from day one, this place is the place of love. This place is a place of acceptance. This place is a place of inclusive. I know this is a buzzword in the world we live in, but it's the place of inclusivity. I ain't going to kick no one out of this place. I ain't going to kick no one out of this place, however they come through that door. And when we get to the new place, whoever comes, however they come, they come. And, there's, and I say, come on, guys. I welcome anybody and everybody through that door. That's what I'm going to do, and that's what I'm going to continue doing. We have a place of forgiveness, understanding, patience, kindness. We don't gossip, we don't criticize, we open every, we welcome everybody with open arms. Unity protects from evil. Because evil sometimes works, evil works in the darkness. It's subtle. Yeah, it hides, it connives, it lies. It hides things, it's secretive, it doesn't say. That's evil, yeah? The person who's having an affair never does it in the open, do they? The person who's having an affair ducks and dives and connives and meets in hotels and meets in little passageways and all this and does all those things. Why? They're hiding something. And there are people live like that in church. How can I hide? How can I hide? How can I hide? No, man, that is not unity. He tears down, it harms people, he ruins people. And you know what the funny thing is? This is funny. Let's have some water. Everyone sees it. That's the funny thing. We think that no one knows. But most people see and think, what's going on here then? I want a church that is so red hot of in unity. So red hot. That you know what? You've only got. We were, I, I went into the into the mission, 
on Thursday with Michael DeCosta. And he plays the piano. And um, I said, open up the piano, Mike, and play something. He put one hand on a chord and he burst out crying. This is tall, tough Michael. He just burst out crying. I'm like, what's up? You know, really good I am, like, what's up? He just looked at me. He never said a word. I'm thinking, did I do something? You know what I mean? It's a bit of a comedy thing, really. I'm like, did I do something? And he, just, and he honestly, this is true, he just sat there. Oh dear, what's going on? And he just burst out crying. And he said, Keith, the anointed in this place. Even Thursday, no one had done anything. He just went in and touched the piano. And the anointing that was in that room was electric. I ain't kidding. It was electric in there. And I'm thinking, you know what? I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose that. Because every week we have to come here and we have to do with all the, we have to deal with all the demons that have been in and out all week. You know, from people using it. Without we we are gonna do that there. It's prepared. The presence of God is waiting for us to go there. I don't want us to go there. You know, with all these things to ruin it when we get there. Yeah? yeah? yeah. Very quickly. Oh dear, very quickly. Characteristics of unity. And I'll be very quick. Number one, to walk in unity demands humility. To walk in unity demands humility. And we read from Philippians 2, I, I love this, this is one of my favourite passages in the entire Bible, but it says that Jesus made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. He found, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But God exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. See, unity demands Unity demands humility because when we humble ourselves, God will do the exalting. God will do the exalting. Uh, but to me, you know, let, I'll just very quickly, when we are humble, we understand who we are and what we can bring to others and where we need help. Okay? We don't, when we're humble, we don't constantly need the approval from other people. Why? Because you know who you are in Christ. The approval of other people is nice, but you don't live your life needing it. It's always nice. You know what I mean? It's always a it's always a bonus. We'll admit we're wrong. We treat everyone with respect. It allows us to live in peace, and we're willing to serve people. I love Christians, again, this makes me laugh about religious folk. You know, I've got an issue with religious people, but anyway. Because religious people have always say, oh, it's me and God, it's me and God, me and God. But they're rude to you, and they're nasty to you, but it's me and God, oh, I'm totally wonderful. No, because your relationship with God should affect the way you treat people. And if you're gonna be rude to people and ignore people, then I'm gonna put a humongous question mark of your relationship with God. Because if you are like that to people, what are you doing with him? You're walking deceived. You can't just say, well, at least me and God, me and God. Or this generation is full of those people. That's why folk don't come to church. Because they say, well, I can survive. It's just me and God. I can stay at home without me. Where's Steve's guitar? Steve, here we got a guitar, right? If the head is the head, yeah? Who's that? Who's the head of the church? Jesus. Jesus. And what's that called? The body. Who's the body? Us. Us. And what are these then? Strings. What do the strings do? They connect the body to the head. Yes. Yeah? So what's that? That's you faithfully coming to church. Faithfully being with believers. Faithfully meeting with believers. Faithfully serving. The head is pointless and the body is pointless if there's nothing to connect the two. Do you get what I'm saying? It becomes important. The neck, the strings of a guitar are, are important. You can't have the neck and the body without the bit in the middle. You know, you can't have the, the body and you can't have 
Jesus and say, well, I'll ignore the middle bit. I'll never go to church. I can survive. Let me just watch God TV. I'll give you six months. You'll be back sitting. Nothing wrong with God TV because the people who started God TV were in the church that we were part of when we were in Africa. Nothing wrong with them. But that's not how God has designed us. God has designed us to be in fellowship with other believers. Anyway, I'll move on quickly. Time's gone. Second characteristic of unity is to be gentle. To be gentle. Thirdly, time is gone. You can, you can write them down, but I'll just go through. <coughs> is to be patient. Patient, we just think he's patient when someone's having to go at you. That's how we see patience. If someone's giving you some, if Caroline is giving yeah, Chris an ear bashing, you know, Chris has got to be patient. That's not, that's, that's not what I'm referring to as such. When we are patient, we persevere. When we're patient, we're full of acceptance. When we're patient, we live a peaceful life. What do we, yeah, because when we're patient, we persevere, we are willing to wait for certain things. When we've accepted, we've accept, when we have acceptance, we're accepting of people and we, we are waiting patiently for that person to grow and change. But we accept them. And when we're peaceful, when we go through trials and tribulations, we remain co clothed, clothed in the peace of God. The next one, forbearance. Ah, back one. Just forbearance. Forbearance is different to patience. Slightly better, forbearing is to be patient, but to be full of self-control, restraint, and tolerance. Self-control, stop doing some of the things you're doing, mate, because it's wrong. Stop it. Jesus said that to some people when, when there were certain things he did. He just said, stop what you're doing. Go and sin no more. That's what he said. That's what he, stop it. In our language, stop doing that. Come on. Okay, move on. But just stop it. Sometimes we're doing things that are wrong. Stop it. Be restrained. Stop chasing with certain people. It's wrong. Be tolerant of people. Finally, and I'm looking at the time because I don't want to take too much time. The fifth one here is a characteristic of unity is to walk in love. Now, when you think, oh, I used to hate messages like this. Because to me, they're just ooey gooey type of rubbish, aren't they? You gotta love people. You know what I mean? It just used to think, oh. so I'm, I'm careful not to present it like that because I think there's more to love than that. Yeah? yeah. John chapter 15, and if you've read, ever read the Gospel of John, you know, John is a bit of a loving book. You know, the beloved disciple he was called, yeah? You know, we would, he was loved by Jesus, but his book is full of love. But I like John 15, verse 13, because this is a, a definition of love for me. Greater love is no man than this, that he laid down one's life for his friends. Oof. You lay down your life for other people. Ooh, that's a, that's a tough one. Because sometimes you want to punch him, don't you? But he says, you lay your life down for them. That's how you treat them. Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Would you honestly die for somebody in, in this room? Because some of you are too selfish to say yes. Shoot from the hip. Would you lay your life down for somebody in this room? This is my this, this is my weird desire to walk into a church. I'll get I'll get in prison, so I can't do it. <laughs> Jenny's face. She's like, don't say this, dude. Don't say it. Sometimes, sometimes my mind just you know you've got to use imagination good sometimes, and my imagination is a bit there sometimes. I just like to walk into a church with a gun, okay, and just ask people, do you follow Christ or not? And if you do, I'm going to shoot you. Because I think sometimes 
Those people who think they're saved and think they're following Christ would run away and say, well, no, 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 just like Peter, we deny Christ. But you know, there's a time coming in this world where that will happen. They think, oh, it is. In fact, you go to Nigeria, you come with me to Nigeria. And there's places there where they'll go in with an AK-47 and they'll ask the congregation, do you follow Christ? Bang, you're dead. And then you hear of an entire church that's been massacred. Now that happens a lot in northern Nigeria. I have friends over there, I've been over there. It happens there a lot. We're just, at this, this moment in time, we're preserved from that. But the day will come when that is the intensity of our walk with Christ. Do you love me enough that you will follow me even if someone puts a gun to your head? And in fact, would you say, would you put your life on the line to save somebody else's? Because that's what Jesus did. He laid down his life while we were still sinners for us. Just a thought. I'm not asking you to say yes, please, and sign up here. You know what I mean? I'm not asking for. A, I'm not asking you to sign up. It's, it's just a question. Reflect. Just think. Would you? Would you not? Because it's something that we have to consider. To be fair, I remember having a conversation with a girl when I was in Australia. Back in back, it was '89 when I went to Australia, and um, in a church in Melbourne, and we had this conversation about. Whether it's a bit of an obscure conversation, but was 19. Would you, do you think that you'll ever die as a martyr for, for Jesus? That was a conversation, really edifying conversation. <laughs> do you think you would die? And there were some people there who said they, would be, they believed they were called as missionaries and they believed that probably one day they would. They think, see, we live over here, and our prayer request is the roadworks along Cot Lane. I wish those roadworks would go. Let me pray. And yet, in other parts of the world, there are such intense, intense situations that it demands a greater commitment and a greater level of hunger and desire for God. We play easy over here. I'm not trying to scare all of you, but I'm just saying sometimes. We just have to consider these things. You know, unity. You know, someone's saying some stuff they shouldn't, doing stuff they shouldn't. Would you go to that person and say, excuse me, this church is about unity. Can you not do that, please? Would you do that? Or would you just say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm safe. What would be your level of commitment? Just a, just a thought, just a question throw it out there for you to think. Because we are one together. Yeah? We are one together. Let's just read Psalm 92 and I'll close. <coughs> you know, I've only probably done about 5% of what's in front of me. Never mind. Looks like I'm reading the script. I keep turning the page. I'm not. I'm just skipping. I'll skip that. I'll skip that. Psalm 92, verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They will bear fruit in old age. They will be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. There is no unrighteousness in him. The righteous, you and I, shall flourish like a palm tree. We will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. We can't play games in church anymore. I've got this as a final comment. Unity comes and is born out of trust. If you are living your place from a place of past hurt, you will find it difficult to trust in the present. If you are living your life, if you are living your life from a place of past hurt, you will find it difficult to trust in the present. And unity demands that we trust each other. 
If I don't trust Caroline, I'm always going to think she's suspicious. Now, Caroline is just going around Caroline's life, doing Caroline's thing. Harming nobody, just doing her thing. Well, I'm suspicious of you, Caroline. Okay. I'm all going now. Yeah? No, he's got nothing to do with you. It's all down to me. My past hurt. You see? Well, that's what we like to do in church. We like to put that on other people and blame them. It's not. If you want to trust in the present, let go of the past. That's the best way to put it. If you want to trust in the present, let go of the past. However hard it's been, however difficult it's been. And we have an opportunity now. How we leave this place is how we enter. If we let go of some of those things, put our bags down and our suitcases down, we can walk light, we can walk in unity, and the best thing is, and we can't avoid this, and we can't dis um, discuss it away, when we walk in unity, we're blessed. If we're not in unity, we're not blessed. So we've got to do everything we can to protect that with each other. And just say, you know what? I'm all for unity. I'm what I want, and I do more than you realize, the presence of God. You know what I mean? I am still waiting for the day that in worship, the presence of God hits you all, and you're all on your face worshiping God. Not because we just something to do, just because you're in awe of God's presence there. And I'm thinking, oh, God, give me that. Well, God said, there's some steps we've got to take to get there. And this is one of them. This is one of them. So my encouragement to all of us is, just consider. I know it's a bit of an interesting type of message again for me. And you know, Jenny will probably ask me, did you plan that? I'm like, probably 20% of it. But, but you've got to go with what you feel God is saying. And you know, we are going to go to a new place, new opportunity. And you know what? I'm already there, by the way. I, when they gave me the key on, Thurs on that Thursday, I left this place. I, that's the type of person I am. I'm gone. I'm already there. You know what I mean, I, had, I told the guys yesterday, two nights ago, I had a dream. The band was playing. Michael DeCosta was there. A bit weird, but John also had the same dream. Um, Michael was there. John was preaching. He says he wasn't. He says he wasn't, but I think he was. I think he was. But, but we had that there, but the interesting thing was the presence of God was all over the place. And I'm thinking, oh God, I want to get there now. I want to get there now because I want that presence. There's, when you've tasted good honey, horrible honey is not very nice. Do you get what I'm saying? When you've tasted the presence of God, nothing else matters. And I think that's all I want is the presence of God. Amen.